What an exchange he made for me and you. How could we ever forget that? How could we ever neglect that? How can we even consider going another, op, another way, realizing the price he paid for us? And I mean, gosh, how dumb can we be and still breathe? <laughs> oh, glory. This is the night the Lord has made, and we will rejoice because we have a choice. Amen? Amen. You know, one of the things I'm always reminded of is, you know, when, after Jesus rose from the dead and he hung around for 40 days, blew everybody's mind, they never know when he was going to appear. You know. And then when he was getting ready to part, and he gathered those that were willing to follow him, those disciples, and he said, come here. And he breathed on them. He breathed the breath of God on them. He wanted to sustain them until they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So he breathed upon them and he took off. He said, just wait 10 days and go to the upper room. And of course, he told 500 disciples and only 120 showed. As I always said, the other ones started denominations. Because this is not about a denominational thing. It's about a relationship. And the relationship is not a carnal relationship. It is not a mind relationship. It is a relationship in the spirit. And it is the ministry of the spirit. And so many times we're trying to have a relationship with God through the mind and not through the spirit. And I've shared before about the vision I had a while ago about all the black suits. They're all suits. Bunch of suit dudes. And they're all pressing into the front. And all of those that were pressing into the front. And, and there were those that weren't pressing in the front. And they were just standing there. But they were getting around and they were pressing into the front, pressing into the front. And I began to realize the ones that were pressing into the front had no head. So these were suits, black suits, with no heads on them. And all the ones that were not pressing into the front had heads. And I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, I'm raising up a headless army. And what he was trying to tell me, because see, the mind is associated with the soul. He said, I'm going to raise up soldiers that do not live out of the soul, but out of the spirit. And they were the forerunners. They were the front runners because they could not be moved. See, you can easily be moved if you're living out of the soul. When you allow the soul to dictate your feelings to dictate your decisions, that means something is there. Go to Genesis chapter 2. All glory. Genesis chapter 2. Remember, Satan's greatest weapon is deception. He loves to come and imitate God. <laughs> That's one of his great deceptions. That's why there's so much religious stuff going on. That's why there's familiar spirits. Familiar spirits love this. All demons love the soulish realm. That's where they're at. Then they get you to do the works of the flesh. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's speak. it. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the hosts of them were finished. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all of his work, which God had created and made. This is the history of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Before the, any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown. Now, I want you to understand something. This is before the earth was restored. See, he's talking about something before the earth was restored because the earth was restored after it had been frozen. Because there was an original earth, then there was a chaotic earth, and then there was a restored earth. And it became chaotic because of the fall of Satan. Because Satan was the praise and worship leader of the universe, and he ruled the earth. He was in charge of the earth. 
And when he was in charge of the earth, the earth was inhabited by angels. There were cities here. There was all kinds of things going on here. These were pre-Adamic. And then when Lucifer rebelled against God, God shut down the earth and everything became chaotic. And he set him into darkness. Lucifer, who was a beautiful angel, the praise and worship leader of the universe, now became ugly. He lost his beauty. That's why he, was, he, he, he deceives people. That's why he's called an angel of light, but he's now longer a light carrier. That's a false light. Just like the moon. The moon lights up at night, but the moon has no light. It only can reflect from the original light, which is the sun. And that's what Lucifer does also. Is everybody okay? All right. So he says, before any plant and field and so forth in the earth and before any herb of the field had grown. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to till the ground. I want you to know something. Does God need someone to till the ground? Heck no. He wasn't trying to raise a garden and bring out fruit. Amen? He did. <laughs> so many people, oh, he needed. Adam was a tiller. Adam was not a, a, a gardener. He was not God's gardener of the paradise. He was one to rule. When it talks about it, he was looking for someone to till. He was looking for someone to rule. Is everybody all right? Amen. And there was no man to till the ground, but a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed a man of the dust of the ground, and he did something. He breathed. He breathed God's breath, life-giving breath, into his nostrils. It's called the breath of life. It is called the breath of God. And man became a living being, or what we call a living soul. His spirit, his soul, and his body was one. They were not divided. Adam was an eternal being. He did not have blood. He didn't need it. The life of his body was in the spirit. Everything. The life of his soul was in the spirit. It was not in the blood. He didn't have blood until he fell. Blood did not come until they sinned. Then blood came. Is everybody okay? All right. Verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God, again, God breathed into the dust. He formed a living being known as a living soul or a spirit, soul, and body that was one. They were one. And what was happening, the driving force of life was known as the breath of God. He was the driving force, the driving force of life. Everything that he spoke, when he spoke in, everything was the driving force was his breath all the time. In fact, it's still moving. Everything that sustains the universe is the breath of God and through his word. Every time God spoke, there was words and breath. And when these words created, they were, those are the things that were substance. And his breath was the driving force that caused everything to come to pass. Is everybody all right? Amen. Praise God. So the driving force was the breath of God. Adam had a, Adam had the, a God life. He was created in God's image and likeness. In Adam was the character of mother and father in him. It wasn't about gender. Remember, he was an eternal being. Amen? Does everybody get this? Try to see this through. Our peanut brain has a hard time comprehending this stuff. And, and the Lord said, look at man. I want you, this is going to be paradise. This is how I'm going, I'm going to set a new race. I'm going to set a new creation of race. And in this, you'll be my first one. You'll be in my image and likeness. And I want everyone to follow you. So I'm going to train you in the garden. I'm going to teach you my ways, but I've given you a free will. So here's something important. 
Because the driving force of life is my breath, which is in you. If you maintain that by eating from the tree of life, you will maintain that position. But if you choose, because I've given you a free will, if you choose to not eat from that tree, but eat from another tree, you will lose my breath. And you will take on another breath. Has everybody got it? Oh, hallelujah. The free will choice. The tree of self. The tree of self. Or the tree of life. <laughs> Adam and Eve lost the God of life. And they entered the realm of self-life after they had sinned. Bringing separation to the spirit, soul, and the body. Losing the breath of God. And replacing it with the breath of self. An unclean breath, a rebellious breath, and a breath of death. Go to 1 Thessalonians 5. And what is the driving force? The driving force of life is the Holy Spirit. That's why he is the breath of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So then, you know, this was very shocking to Adam and Eve because all of a sudden they realized that everything was about themselves. They lost communion with God. That inner voice, except for a conscience, that was the only way God can speak to them now or warn them. And in this, it was devastating to them to be removed from paradise and sent into the world. But they were into the world now because of self. They recognized self. Now there was a life of self. From that point on, it would be a life of self all the time. And the spirit, soul, and body was divided now. Now the soul had picked up another breath. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's speak it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 12. Okay. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now, why would he want to say that? Because one of the things that Adam and Eve lost was the recognition of the one that was ruling over them, right in the garden. And to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. But be at peace among yourselves. Now, we exhort you, brethren, and warn those who are unruly, Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, and be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, here we go. And do not what? Do not quench. Do not quench the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he is the driving force. He is the breath of God. Why? Because when we quench him and he steps away, we breathe something else. Oh, this is, this is wild. We've got to grab hold of it. He says, do not quench the spirit and don't despise prophecies. One of the Psalms was about, please, Lord, do not remove me from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Hmm. Again, one of the major problems here. I'm going to go a little further. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of what? Evil. And may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Are you ready for this? And what's he saying? Sanctify. Sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is powerful. He's telling us all of those areas, your spirit, your soul, and body must come into submission to the driving force of the Holy Spirit. Has everybody got it? Oh, hallelujah. So one of the things that must be done is recognizing. Recognizing. That's, you know, when, when they lost what was lost in the garden or paradise, place of pure fellowship with the creator there was training 
for reigning in the, in the garden. Um, there was the beginning of a new race of existence. And the Lord was telling him, don't stop the breath of God. Don't stop. Don't, don't let this be removed from you. He warned him over and over. Why? Because your spirit is associated with God. He must maintain in that relationship. When you are born again, you get a brand new spirit. But your soul ain't born again. It must be converted. Amen? Your soul is not. So your soul, every part of your being now, your spirit and your soul must have breath. Your body is the only thing that doesn't need breath. Go to Leviticus 17. Leviticus 17. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? In verse 11. Everyone there? Let's speak it together. Leviticus 17 and verse 11. For the life of the body or of the flesh is in the blood now. Has everybody got it? Why? Because after Adam and Eve fell, blood was brought forth. In fact, when Adam and Eve fell, they tried to cover themselves because it was now a self-life. And the Lord said, man, that ain't going to work. So he killed an animal. And he covered them. Why? He had to sacrifice an animal for blood. Because he now was using blood to sustain their body in this realm. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for what? Your souls. Your mind, your will, your emotions, your desires, your imaginations. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. For what soul? That Life-giving being that was created. God created when he breathed into Adam. He created a living being or a living soul. The problem is, is that after their fall, our spirit, soul, and body was divided. So when you are born again, you are actually, your house is divided. Has everybody got it? You got a new spirit now. Now a house divided will not stand. Unless your spirit man is strong enough to overcome the desires of the soul and the flesh until your soul is converted to come into submission. Is everybody okay? Amen. So the life of the body is in the blood. The life of the soul is in the spirit. And the life of your spirit is in the spirit. Mark chapter 1. The driving force. That's why somebody can get baptized in the Holy Spirit, pray in tongues and all kinds of stuff, and they'll st still do stupid stuff because their soul's not completely converted yet. Mark 1, verse 11. Uh, verse 10. And immediately coming up from the water... He, Jesus saw the heavens parting and the spirit descending upon him like a dove. Then the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what's the next word? Immediately. Immediately the spirit did what? He drove. He didn't drive a vehicle. Amen. He drove. He said, look at man, we're going. Immediately the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness to battle. And he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, was, was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. <laughs> wow. So the Spirit drove, the breath of God drove him. He is the driving force of life and the driving force of victory. He is the driving force of life and the driving force of victory. 
Because without him, there is no victory. And Luke 19. Luke 19 and verse 41. So Jesus was driven into the wilderness to battle. Holy Spirit drove him in there. And after he comes out, Holy Spirit said, okay, we're going to do a couple more cleanup. I'm going to dry, I'm going to call, now that I, 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 we drove out, I drove you into the wilderness, now I'm going to use you to drive out some things. And Luke 19, verse 41 now as he draw near, he saw the city and wept over it and saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Wow. Then he went into the temple and he began to what? Drive out those who had bought and sold in it, saying to them, it is written, my house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And as he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Let me share with you, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the enemy is after you. He's after you because he fears you. He's, but one of the things he doesn't want you to do is get that soul converted. He'll do everything he can to prevent the completion of your soul. See, people don't realize that when the soul is not converted completely or the spirit doesn't have dominion over the soul, we become dangerous. God cannot trust in an individual because their decisions are up and down. Their emotions are up and down. They are not steadfast. They're not solid. And they're too easily movable. Is everybody okay? Amen. So again, the Spirit first drove Jesus into the wilderness to battle. Then he drove him into the temple to drive out evil. Amen? Amen. John 3. John chapter 3 and verse 1. Let's speak it together. There was a man of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night because he sure wasn't going to come to him by day. He would have been seen, and he would have lost his club to the religious sect. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to Moses, Surely I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, How can this a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Obviously, he did not have the spirit because he, he didn't understand a thing. <laughs> but he knew the scriptures. The problem is, is he didn't interpret them correctly. Or he would have known what was what. He had, an under, he had some sort of understanding or he wouldn't have gone to Jesus. But all the rest of them did not have the interpretation of the scriptures. Especially when Jesus cried out and said, man, you missed the visitation. Now all of these things are going to come because you missed the opportunity. You missed the way of escape. Oh, hallelujah. Is everybody all right? In verse 6. Oh, let's start at verse 5. And Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
Now, born of water and born of the Spirit means through the remission of sin, which is a baptism, you get washed by the blood, by the water. But actually, you, when you repent, you get washed by the blood. That's known as uh, the born of water. And of the Spirit. Those are two baptisms. He cannot, enter the, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind, the driving force, blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from where it go and where it goes. So everyone who is born of the Spirit. Why? Because it's the Spirit that drives us to where. It's the Spirit that leads us. We call it drive, but He actually leads us. The Word says that God causes us to do things. Amen? But He won't come against you. You can resist Him, and He'll just stop. He'll just back off. Amen? Oh, Hallelujah. So we see the driving wind is the breath of life. It is the breath of God. It is the driving force. It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the carrier of et the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty, which is called the anointing. In John 14. In verse 1. Is everybody okay? Are you getting this? Let not your heart be what? Troubled. Troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, he says. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I'll receive you to myself. And that where I am, there you may also be. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas Doubting Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I want you to picture this because if you, the way, the truth, and the life, put three boxes there. The way to your left, the truth is in the middle, and the life is to the right. That is called the tabernacle, the outer court, the holy place, and the most holy place. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except for through me. So we see here that Jesus was explaining that he is the eternal port, the tabernacle. But there's something else associated with this, which is important, because this is why we're talking about the driving force. And when you'll begin to see this unfold. The outer court is known as the way. It's also known as the body. It's the place of the flesh, the body. The holy place is known as the truth. It's also known as the place of the soul. And the most holy place is the place of life. It's also known as the place of the spirit. Amen? The spirit. So you have the body, the soul, and the spirit. The outer court, the holy place, the most holy place. So what God is trying to do, he had to try to drive the spirit through. And he had to pay the price for it. In John 5, 1 John 5, I'm sorry. First John chapter 5 and verse 6. And he begins to explain the tabernacle, the one in heaven and the one on earth. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6, let's speak it. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit. So if you picture that Father, the Word, and the Spirit, that's And, and there are three that bear witness in heaven, and then there are three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So when you begin to look at this, what the driving force 
that connects between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm is the Holy Spirit. Again, he's the driving force. So you have the Spirit in the most holy place. You have the water in the holy place because the water is known as the word washing. And then you have the blood in the outer court. Has everybody got it? All right. If you hold on to that, you'll see something happen. So we must, for you and I, we must get through the blood to the spirit. Amen? So that's why the blood always goes before the spirit. So you and I must get through the blood and maintain that arena of being cleansed to maintain the arena of fellowship with the spirit of God. When there is unrepentance, it grieves the Holy Spirit. And we begin to take on something else. Oh, hallelujah. Matthew 27. Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus was on the cross. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earthquake and the rocks were split. In other words, the most holy place veil was ripped. Why? The driving force of the Spirit was coming through. And the graves were opened, and many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And they didn't come alive. They didn't come out until after Jesus rose from the dead. And coming out of the graves, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared too many. So the driving force of the life, the breath of God, was released to all mankind, washed by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ from the most holy place of the tabernacle. But many times the soul blocks that driving force of the breath by deception and lies from the enemy. Know that you can block the driving force of the Holy Spirit. Because the soul has another agenda. Has everybody got this? And Matthew 10. Matthew 10 and verse 1. Simple one. Important to get this understanding. In verse 1, he said, Jesus said, when he had called his disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits. Over unclean spirits. Over unclean breath. He gave them power over unclean breath. Wow. To cast them out. And to heal all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease from this unclean breath. Unclean spirits are called unclean breath. Has everybody got it? Go to Matthew 12. Remember... Every voice, amen, has a presence. Every voice, every thought has a voice. Every voice has a presence. In verse 43, when an unclean spirit, an unclean breath goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So it shall be with this wicked generation. So they come back, don't they? What they're trying to do is get you to build on what you had been freed from. Because when they, if they can convince you to do that, it becomes an abomination. In 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second 
2 Timothy chapter 1. In verse 7. We'll start at verse 6, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. So we've got to really become more clear and recognize the arena that these are not just words that we hear. These are not just thoughts that we hear. These are words. These words are carried by an unclean breath so that that breath can enter you. Therefore, in verse 6, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of what? Fear. Fear. So this is a spirit. It's an unclean breath. It's an evil breath. But power and love and a sound mind. So when the spirit comes, he begins to nullify sound mind, power, and love. Why? Because it begins to promote the life self all over again. Now it's about me. So you people begin to do things to fulfill themselves. Drink, smoke, lust. They begin to fight for their lives again because of that one word that was released with the breath. That one word enticed that people to accept it. That spirit enters that person. And I don't care if you, you're spirit filled or whatever, that demon is there. If you're still doing the thing, if you don't have control over something, there's a spirit there that has control over you. Whether it's torment, whether it's addiction, I don't care what it is. Gluttony, nicotine, I don't care what. Dependency on drugs, whatever it is. There's a spirit there. And God wants that breath removed. And it's our responsibility to drive that spirit out with the true spirit of life. Amen? Amen? Oh, hallelujah. These are demons. Our presence of evil. They release words enforced by breath, their breath, to enter the soul and corrupt it with unbelief and lust. And they bring bondage. Again, many times. Now, when that begins to happen, we actually... When that's happening, that person begins to reject the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's saying, look at man, you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to come out of it. You know this is what's happening. You know this ain't right. No! The justification comes. Reasoning comes. Why? Because that presence is there. Then compromise, complacency, laziness, fear. Now you're fighting for your life and you begin to fight for the things that you made mistakes for in your past. See, now it's a battle for survival. It really isn't a battle for the presence of God. It changes. Now there's no surrender. It's a constant battle. and You just find yourself in torment. You find yourself never getting further ahead. You find yourself backsliding. You find yourself in an area where you know you're displeased with your own life. You know you should be in another place that you're not. You know it. Because the soul is blocking. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 1. Is everybody there? Amen. Let's speak it. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the what? Air. Air. Why? Because there's a new breath. That's that breath. Remember, the ruler of this earth is Satan and his kingdom, demons. So when a person is beginning to walk according to the course of the world, they're accepting another breath. 
The Spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, which is the soul, and were by nature of children of wrath, just as the others. Again, when a person finds himself walking in any of the course of the world again, his soul is now breathing in the breath of unclean spirits. It is a different thing. It's a different presence. It's a different breath. It is bringing disobedience. These are spirits that enter now all because of a word that was spoken. Unforgiveness, jealousy, whatever it may be, fear. It only takes one word for that spirit to calm that breath. But that word is only an enticement and it's forced by that breath, by that spirit. That's why spirits are called breath. Unclean spirit, unclean breath. Is everybody okay? The prince of power of air rules the earth with deception, fear, lust, diseases, and death. Invades souls of mankind, blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit's anointing. I want to say it again. It invades the souls of God's children and mankind, blocking the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Oh, 1 John chapter 2. The driving force. The driving force. So the anointing is actually the driving force of life eternal and victory. Why? Because he is the breath of the eternal presence and power of God Almighty. He's the truth. That's what drives out darkness. That's what drives out the unclean breath, the unclean spirits. But it's our responsibility to take dominion. And it's our responsibility to constantly, stay, constantly be filled, not in the feel of spirit man, to overcome. But so we have dominion over our own soul. That's why the word talks about the saving of the soul. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Is everybody there? Anybody there? Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's speak it. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Many people are getting deceived. It says they went out from us, but they were not of us. Why? Because their soul had been converted. For it had, if they had been with us, uh, if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they may be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, the driving force of life and victory, and you know all things. I've not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lies, lie is of the truth. Whoever is a liar, <clears throat> who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. See, we deny him when we reject the driving force of the Holy Spirit. We deny him. Oh, well, I'm a believer, but I'm just, no, no, no. Then you deny him. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. That is the Spirit, isn't it? He's the Prince of Power of Air. Who denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father. Therefore, let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to what? Deceive you. Puff you up. Deceive your soul. So that the wrong breath comes back. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, if it does abide in you, and you do allow that driving force of the anointing to rule your life, you do not need anyone to teach you, because he will teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Amen? 
In other words, you're no longer fighting for you no more. When you begin to fight for your life, you're not fighting for his. He said we're to deny our life. And I want to close at Mark 16. So the anointing is the driving force of life eternal and victory. You know, we should be the miracle sign and wonder. Remember, God can use anyone for a miracle sign and wonder. In fact, many will come before him and say, Lord, I did this and this and this. He said, get out of here. You practice lawlessness. We should be the miracle sign and wonder. I don't care if you feed the clothes, the shelter. Do I don't care what you do. I don't care if you have a drug program, a discipleship program. If you ain't right, you'll be judged by God. And you'll, nothing will count that you've done. Nothing. Mark 16, 16. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. He who believes, he who follows and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will what? Cast. In other words, they will drive out unclean breath. Does everybody get this? First of all, we get to drive it out of us, our homes, and everything else. They will drive out. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. They will drink anything deadly, if they drink anything deadly. And it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Why? Because it is the driving force. The driving force of eternal life and victory is the Holy Spirit. Victory's ours. That's why he says we are more than conquerors to those who are in Christ. But Christ means you're in the Spirit. You are walking upright with God. You are immovable. You are not allowing your emotions to dictate anything. You're not allowing circumstances. People who are easily offended. Live out of the soul. That soul isn't converted. Well, you don't know what he said about me. Who gives a hoot? Does God know? That's all that matters. See, everything you and I look at that is what does God know or not. We're not looking at other people. Don't matter. It's no longer about that anymore. It's about having the Lord before us in everything that we do. We're looking to him. People are offended, bitter, trying to get revenge, resentful, forget it. Let it go. Why? Because that's just nothing but a breath from hell that's speaking to you. And it's our responsibility to drive out that breath and make room for the true breath of God or else we'll live a self-life instead of a God life. It's our responsibility. Amen? And too many people are being taken out in that arena. They're living out of the soul instead of out of the Spirit. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. We ask for your forgiveness, mercies, and grace. And repent for anything that we've done that has opened any door to unclean spirits in our life. And we take them in and we drive them out from us, even right now. Anything that we've touched, a thought, word, or deed, Anything that we've rebelled against or rejected the driving force of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we, we repent for living out of the soul and not out of the Spirit. So we surrender to you at all. We su surrender to our soul, our spirit, and our body. And ask that you not only wash us with the blood of the Lamb, but that you would heal us and refill us. Grant us a new spirit. Grant us a new heart. Grant us tonight a new beginning. And remove those things from us that cause us to stumble but cause offense to you. And bring your light, your truth, your life, your divine nature, your divine character, your divine wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and boldness, and power into every part of our being. 
that we may be sons and daughters that please you as signs and wonders to this world in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Be blessed and stay dressed with the glory.